Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. I'm Oji Yakfi. Our next guest is one of the pioneers of cosmetic surgery in Nigeria, West Africa, through her business, Body Enhancement Limited. Before she founded Empower 54 Project Initiatives, an international humanitarian organization dedicated to providing desperately needed humanitarian assistance, such as medical missions, hunger eradication, women girl empowerment, and refugee programs for underprivileged Africans. She recently embarked on a project to donate albendozal, or albendozal that is the um, mom's vitamin, correct? And vitamins and prenatal vitamin medication to women and children across Africa. The project we commenced in Edo State, Nigeria, saw a successful donation of these medical supplies to over 15,000 women and children. She and her team also took the outreach to Congo, where 620,000 children in my Ndombe province re received free medical supply. Joining us on the program is Modukbe Ozolua. Good morning. Welcome to the morning show. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome yeah. to the morning show. Well, congratulations on me. the wonderful things you've been doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I read, you know, your profile, mm -hmm. and you've done a lot in the area of philanthropy. But many Nigerians, uh, when they hear Mudupe Ozolwa, mm -hmm. the first thing they remember is uh, cosmetic surgery, which you made quite popular. Uh, how did you make that shift from cosmetic surgery, which was very lucrative, which put you directly out there on the map. Mm -hmm. How did you move away from that to philanthropy and uh, doing reconstructive surgery for women and men in distress? When I pioneered cosmetic surgery in West Africa in 2001, it, like you said, it put me out there in the news, both internationally and nationally, which meant my doors were open to every and anybody. What created the shift for me was on a certain day, in 2003, two years into providing cosmetic and reconstructive surgery, but for paying clients at that time, was a couple came to my office, a man and his wife. The wife had uh, obvious burns and lacerations, and they needed, she needed reconstructive surgery, but they couldn't afford it because reconstructive surgery is more expensive than cosmetic. Mm -hmm. It's having something that's damaged and having to fix it back it takes a lot more time, more skill, and of course, more money. And they informed me they had made many appeals to people for funds to finance her surgery, but no success, which I, I didn't understand why not, because it was obvious she needed help. And the man looked at me and he said, Madam, why don't you help us? When you speak, people would listen. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there looking at him, and he left my office, and I picked up my phone. I called my head, uh, plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills. I said, okay, that's it. I'm starting a nonprofit. I'm going to be doing free surgeries for underprivileged people. And that's how it started. The first program was Cleft Lip Cleft Palette. At that time, it was called Beers Foundation, because it was body enhancement and or reconstructive surgery. Okay. Yes. But um, over the years, we've done a lot more, because my patron, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, had advised that we expand beyond free surgeries, because mm -hmm. there's so many people who need it beyond needing reconstructive surgery. So we've been doing that for 15, I've been doing that now for 15 plus years. And uh, how rewarding, how profitable is that? I mean, I know, you know. Profitable, it's a non-profit. No, 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 <laughs> I'm not talking of uh, profit in terms of cash. You know, I'm talking generally, how fulfilling is it? It's priceless. So can it's you priceless. give us an idea of some of the things you've done um, in Nigeria with Boko Haram victims, in Congo, and I'm surprised you choose Congo. You why know. not? <laughs> so Given why the peculiar challenges Congo in Congo. Like, tell us why you choose Congo. Really. You have some points that you, we, we discussed earlier. Yes. Uh, why did you choose Congo? Well, for one thing, I've been going to the Congo for the last 14 years. Okay. I have friends there. It's like second home to me. I actually have a residency there. Okay. Yes. Yes. The Democratic DRC. Republic yes. of Congo, yes, the DRC. Yes. And we've always wanted to do some charity work there. Okay. Last year, I was I decided, okay, it's time. Let's do something. We were actually heading to um, North Kivu, because that's where everybody's talking about. I remember when I told some friends, oh, I'm going to North Kivu. They're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Conflict zone. Those people that know me, when they call me, the first thing is, okay, what part of the world are you in Afghanistan? Where are you talking bullets? Because they know I'm always in some volatile place, somewhere sensitive. And... While in Atlanta, because my head office is in Atlanta, 
my uh, one of my board members of my U because Empower Fifty Four is also a U.S. nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We have a five hundred one c three. Uh, he's Congolese, one of my board of directors or board members. And I was actually not in town when one of the governors came to visit and told him about what we're doing there. Immediately we got introduced and he lobbied. He said, okay, fine, you're coming to Congo, but don't go to North Kivu, come to my province first. And on my trip to, instead of going to North Kivu, I decided to go to his province, which is Mindombe, okay. to visit and see what it needed. And... Honestly, after I visited them, I was like, okay, I'm not going to North Kivu because this help, people need There's help so everywhere. Much, yeah. There's so much. Especially with the Ebola thing that happened there, correct? Yes, it's still going on. Yeah. Um, and that's North Kivu. At that time, there was no Ebola. So as I read in your intro, you're one of the pioneers of plastic surgery, right? Actually, the pioneer. The, oh, you are the pioneer. Yes. Okay. And you're also a princess. I just wanted to note that, Yes. Right? Uh, you, if you Google my last name, you will see I'm... Um, you're a daughter of an Oba. In, in Tenth generation of Zolwa, or Great yes. grandfather. Yes. I, I didn't even know that. I just. Yes. <laughs> I just. <okay. laughs> so back to that. You are the pioneer of um, reconstructive surgery and plastic surgery in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Why did you go into that? And you, you're no longer doing that right now, correct? No, I'm not. It was a business investment, that's what okay. it was. And I actually stopped offering cosmetic procedures about five, six years ago. But you see, at that time, mm -hmm. uh, when you were doing cosmetic surgery, it was very uh, popular yeah. with Nigerian women. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, a lot of women, even first Dr. Ladies. Dr. Party is even more, it's more popular now. Yeah, right? but it's now, incredible. you know, this is when you even have the big market for this it. This was the mm -hmm. question. When Nigerian women are more mm -hmm. conscious of, mm -hmm. you know, how they look, even men too. Mm -hmm. You know, and the uh, makeup, the makeup business yes. has become big industry. Everybody is trying to... Uh, so uh, are you likely to go back to it now that, now that it's so the market is, uh, the... looks even more attractive? Not to me. Oh, Why? Okay. I already introduced it at the age of 27. I mm -hmm. put Nigeria on the map in the world as a location for plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. I've done my own bit. I put my, my, my footprints in time where that's concerned in Nigeria. Others should follow and they're doing a good job at it. That's not my calling. It was just a business investment. Mm -hmm. And I, it was meant, and now that I look back, yeah. I realized that was just, like the man said, when you speak, people would listen. Yeah. I didn't know all that then. I really didn't. I was like, okay, I've come to put my money. I've started my business in Nigeria. I didn't live in Nigeria prior to that. That's what brought me back home. Mm -hmm. And it was just an opportunity that was for, created, destined for me to use to see people that needed help. And that changed my life. Mm -hmm. What I used to consider success mm -hmm. in 2001, I promise you that's not what I consider successful now. So I've already done my bit. People should run with it, make their money. I, read, I made money. It wasn't a big deal. I think it wasn't a loss for me. But I've done my bit. It's time for others to continue with and it. What kind of support, what level of support do you get from either government or other agencies for what you are doing uh, in Empower 54 now? Government, I mean, everything's always about partnerships. Some partners come to you. They reach out to you when they hear what you're doing. Um, so let me see, uh, then there's some of them that you, we have to reach out to. So in relation to like Nigeria, for example, we've done in the past different programs in partnership with different state governments. We've done, pro like, uh, for example, when you had mentioned about the Northeast, uh, after we evacuated those uh, in partnership with the state government, the Bonus State government, and also with the military, I personally led that delegation into Bama to evacuate the malnourished children, and which led to the creation of a campaign we have now, which is called NEVI. Okay, talk to us about that, the NEVI campaign. Yes, the NEVI, uh, the acronym represents Nutrition and Education for Life, uh, VIE, which is Life of French, uh, which is focused on eradicating malnutrition in Africa. With severe acute malnutrition, it's already medically proven that what helps to save lives of these children is mm -hmm. when they're given RUTF, which is ready to use therapeutic foods, which I'm sure you know is extremely expensive. We reached out, we knew we had to, we didn't have that kind of funding. So we decided that we should set up a structure whereby we'll locally produce it. We're very fortunate. We reached out to different people. Mm -hmm. And like you say, in relation to partnerships and support, the Australian government mm -hmm. is the one that has funded this program. But well, is it the same as the ready-to-use um, yes, food thing that you yes. do with the IMF as well, correct? The, the IMF, IMF supported is... us also with it, oh. yes, with oh, some wow. funding for it. So how far have you gone? Are you, is it the same program that you're traveling states to say? Or what's that program? Is that a no, different program? That's a different program. Okay. Um, in partnership. Well, let's, let's finish on, on this malnutrition program. How successful has it been? And 
Yeah, it's because there's so many facets to it. Because when we look at uh, there's a question someone always asked was, okay, you give this supplement to children, you save their lives, you leave, what next? Which is a very valid question. Because when you look at malnutrition, it's not just uh, necessarily about hunger and poverty. You also look at the issue of health, sickness, nutrition, environment, the whole aspects. Those are facets that play very, very important roles. And it's not just an issue of the Northeast. It's the federal government has declared malnutrition a national epidemic, which I'm sure you're aware of. Yes. One in every three Nigerian children has malnutrition. Yes. So it's a big issue, and not just children, adults. You go to hospitals, you see malnourished people in the hospitals and all that. Sometimes it's not that they don't have food but they're so sick, their bodies cannot digest what you're giving them. Or you see the early signs of it, and they keep eating the same foods over and over again, or they need to change their nutrition, which are very critical. So what we've done is, in partnership with the Australian government and the support from the IMF, we've set up a small-scale facility in Abuja. With donations, funding, we will produce and give for free across Nigeria. So northeast, south, not everywhere. In the malnourished cases, we will give for free. And then, of course, uh, governments, agencies and whatnot can buy from us in, at a subsidized rate because it's very expensive buying it anyway. At a subsidized rate, then we give out. Then there's the other aspect of it. When we give and we leave, what happens next? With proper treatment, I mean, taking our UTF within about three to four weeks, the child should be completely transformed. Wow. Yes, completely transformed. Okay, we go then. It's back to the same old story all over again. They're going to relapse. Mm. So what we've done is we've reached out to some organizations. Uh, Pro Mercedor, that makes a cowbell milk, has yeah. partnered with us, which this is awesome. They've given us loads of powdered milk. So we're putting together a support package. which will have powdered milk and a bunch of different foods and supplements, which we will give out to them for support at least. Also, sustain them for an additional one or two months to at least keep them out of the from severe acute and then you know moderate acute. They, they stabilize them for a period of time. So that's quite a bit of work in progress. We've gone very far. The factory is already set up. So by before the end of the year, latest early next year, we will start giving things out. Well, you've seen children mm -hmm. uh, who are victims of terror mm -hmm. and their mothers. You've also had to uh, take up the uh, uh, the challenge of malnourished uh, children. From what you have seen, uh, what kind of preventive steps do you think can be taken by government or society generally to provide to prevent this kind of distress uh, that puts pressure on people like you who want to help mm. well actually it's it's the other way around it's for people like me like you and all of us to take pressure off the government people always get that wrong mm -hmm. they always say the government is the government that but they forget that we are the government they are not aliens running a country they're human beings like you and I there is no country, no society, no economy that is fully functional without the full support of nonprofit organizations and individuals. Mm -hmm. When you see a crisis in the U.S., it's a flood, uh, let's say in Houston, there's a hurricane, everywhere is shut down and homes are destroyed. The first thing you see, is it the government you see, Trump or anybody running to rescue? No. The neighbors, nonprofit organizations are stepping up because they understand that it's a collective responsibility. But unfortunately here, everything is, oh, the government is government is, but like I tell people, when you're pointing with one finger, the other fingers are pointing, more fingers are pointing back at you. And I ask people, what are you doing? What have you done? So it's for what we do that we take pressure from the government to make our lives, it's all of us, our lives better. It's not easy, I mean, to be quite honest. It's, I mean, I have conversations like this all the time. People are like, oh, this IDP, the, the. And I look at them and I realize that they don't even know what they're talking about. It's, one, it's easy to sit in your house, listen to the news, hear what you're saying, whatever it is. It's a different story when you're on ground. Well, I understand the argument about collective responsibility mm -hmm. to make society better. Yes. But the people who criticize the Nigerian government at all levels, they insist that government is not even doing the minimum. What do you think? I don't think so. I think they are. How? Oh. I'll tell you why. First of all, we're not used to having such crises in Nigeria. We're not used to having refugee camps. Uh, we do have refugee camps. There are refugees from lots of Africa that come here, uh, Cameroon. We have refugees in Nigeria. And at the same time, we have our own internally displaced persons. We're not used to this. This is new to us. Okay. So when you have that, you have, let's, let's look at this, let's break this down. So for example, you have Borno State as a state. 
It's got its own budget. With the budget, they have to do their infrastructure, salaries, and whatever it is they, they plan to do with it. It does not include feeding four to five million people that have, their homes are destroyed. It does not include accommodating them. It does not include providing free medical care for them. All of a sudden, it's like in your house, you have your budget, which you spend every month in your house for your food. The next thing, 10 <laughs> families who just come from the village and come to your house, and there's your stock with them. And you're looking at your budget. You have a fixed salary. How are you going to accommodate feeding these additional people? How are you going to accommodate taking care of them, their families, giving them clothes? When they're sick, they're looking at you. You have to take care of them. It's a shock to both the state and the federal government. The argument might be they're not acting fast enough, but I don't know what that means. You're not talking about, there are some camps that have 50, 60, 70,000 people in a camp, not 200 people, even 200. It's not a joke. Mm -hmm. You have that going on. You have funding, it is the issue of, and then of course, when you get interna uh, international donations. Mm -hmm. Most of those donations, uh, come, all, not most of them, all of them come with, um, conditions. So you might say, okay, last specific example, the U.S. government gave Nigeria government $2 million for IDPs. And you're thinking, why don't they just go and rebuild their houses? Mm -hmm. But you're not understanding that that money cannot include building infrastructure. That is considered the responsibility of the government. But you can use that to buy buckets. You can buy mattresses. You can do this and that. So you wonder, okay, the same funds are going into the same things, and it's not really you know, necessarily making but much uh, impact as you would want it to be. But if you don't understand that even the government, their, t their hands are tied to quite a great extent, yeah. You know, it's easy to say, oh, they're not doing a lot, but so actually they are. So how can you as an advocate, to, uh, advocate for, the budget, for the government to add all of these things that you have just mentioned I'm in their budget? The I mean, why I'm not? I'm a <laughs> Why not? I mean, these are, these are important points that you've just made. And it's important for the government to add all of these things in their budget to accommodate it. Right? But they are. That's why they have money for infrastructure development. It's already there in the budget. It's always been there. But then at the same time, you look at funds that could be put towards rebuilding uh, communities destroyed. You're dealing, having to apply all those funds to support the military to keep fighting insurgency, well, which is just ongoing. I want to ask you two quick questions mm -hmm. because we don't have more time. Mm -hmm. The first is for you to comment on the kind of challenges and risks that you face. Uh, she alluded to it earlier when she said there is Ebola in, uh, in uh, mm -hmm. Congo. Yes. Uh, that's one. There are other likely risks, of course. And then the second part, Empower 54, the name of your organization. Mm -hmm. uh, you are looking at all the 54 countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that too ambitious? Isn't it better to just stay in the corner of uh, Nigeria or, or West Africa and not worry about saving the whole of Africa? Well, do you say that to UNICEF, that they should stay in the, just stay in New York as the head yeah, office for the UN? An no, do you effort. say that to save the children and all of those bits? So you should never, ever discourage, because I'm a Nigerian, mm. and say, stay in your country. I'm a Nigerian-American. I am global. I am not restricted to Nigeria. We're working in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We're working in Liberia. We're working in Nigeria. And as a humanitarian, it's my responsibility to say when we're invited... People are already saying, come to Syria, come to Libya. I'm like, that's not amongst the 54 countries in Africa. But when people see that, and it's easy to verify that we're yeah. a serious-minded organization and we deliver, yes. then the invitations come up. And we're like, fine, let's do it. And risks, there are always risks. But then how can you actually go out to, to help people if you don't take risks? Okay, so this is your full-time job now because we used to see you before I am an entrepreneur. Right? I do have yeah. uh, different business interests that don't require as much as my involvement yeah. because that's exactly how I've structured it. So I dedicate more of my time to this because it's what I love to do the most. Well, thank well, you very much, Moduko Zodua, for coming to the morning show. It's such a pleasure show. to have thank you. This has been uh, quite uh, insightful. Thank you <laughs> thank very you. much. I wish you success okay. in everything that you do. Thank you. That's thank all you. from Moduko Zodua. Up next, the founder of LagosMoms.com the first website in Nigeria dedicated to moms, parents, and caregivers, Yeti Williams, will be here.